Hi, and welcome back to my channel. I decided that this setup is kind of working for me, so I hope it's working for you or will work for you. I know the quality is not the best, but um, it's easier for me to do this on a sort of live basis so that um, I can upload it sooner. So anyway, um, today I wanted to talk about premarital sex. And I know a lot of times um, it can seem like that is only prevalent in the younger society. But that's not 100% true. And um, I'm sure that you can agree with me there that um, this is just not happening in our youth. This is happening to middle age and older individuals. And so today I wanted to talk about um, that and just kind of go over some scriptures. Now, everything that I state, I'm praying <laughs> that um, is all strictly coming from scripture, from what God has set out, you know, the examples. And I really try to do my research and um, make sure that I'm giving you a full picture. But, um, so please don't take anything personal. I'm not, you know, it's not me saying this. I'm not being judgmental. It's coming from scripture. So I just wanted to preference by saying that. So, um, when we think about the establishment of sexual relations, we know that God designed sex to be within a committed relationship between one man and one woman. And, you know, as I stated before, you know, we always want to fix and adjust the word of God to, to be less harsh on ourselves, I guess. But when we humanize it, we, we remove it from its intended context. Premarital sex involves any level of intimacy experienced in human relationships that are not godly intended. And any kind of sexual contact prior to entering into a legal marriage is premarital sex. So let's look at scripture and traditional Christianity to explore why or reasons that this act faces so much opposition. In Matthew chapter 9 or chapter 19 verse 5 in Mark chapter 10 verse 9 um, God states that a man will leave his family, join his wife, and become one flesh with her. And we can also see this at the beginning of times when he created Adam and Eve in Genesis chapter 2, verse 24. Um, one flesh. So, First um, Corinthians chapter 6, verse 12 through 20, talks about God's lordship over our bodies as well as our souls. In verse 16, it is written that when a man has sex with a prostitute, they have become one body. And so let's make sure that we hinge on to that particular wording, one body, okay? So with that sentiment, let's talk about soul ties because I have heard so many people talk about tying their souls with individuals that they have had premarital or any type of uh, sexual contact with. So the idea of soul ties is a man-made speculation which some teachers superimpose onto scripture in an attempt to explain certain human behaviors. Soul ties are said to be connected from one person's soul to into another person's soul, a concept that has no basis in scripture. The only close and biblical example would be the close relationship of David and Jonathan. In the King, King James Version, 
of 1 Samuel verse 18, I'm sorry, chapter 18 verse 1 states, The soul of Jonathan was knitted with the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as his own soul. But this is simply a way of expressing Jonathan's total commitment and deep friendship with David. And to make this passage a teachable scripture that explains the soul binding is unwarranted. The Bible does warn against entering ungodly relationships. Proverbs 1 Chapter 1, verse 10, and in verse 15, My son, if sinners entice you, do not give in to them. Do not go along with them. Do not set foot on their paths. This passage and others warn us against the wrong type of friendships. But do not assert the ideal of any type, any type of spiritual union of souls. As previously mentioned in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 16, Do you not know that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her in body? For it is said, the two will become one flesh. So, just so we're clear, it states body. That the body is joined. The Bible says nothing of the joining of the souls. Now, do I feel that um, there is a uh, emotional tearing of the soul? It is not scriptural, but I feel like when you go from relationship to relationship, you do leave a piece of you. And the reason that um, sometimes you suffer great heartbreaks, you struggle to leave that person is because... You do unite the way that God intended for a married couple to unite to become one body. And when you leave fragments of yourself with various individuals, then it stands to uh, tear that concept. And then, and this is just me talking. To me, I feel like you're not able to fully connect your entire whole body to one person because you've been torn apart by all these other individuals that your your heart you know our heart hurts and when it's broken by different by having different relationships yes it takes time to heal yes you for, forget that and so um you know but let's just be clear on that scripture does not in any way talk about soul ties so um, I just wanted to make sure that you knew that uh, in relation to body and soul two different things okay so let's move on to to um, where we go from here when we experience these uh, feelings of unworthiness and hopeless thinking because we have experienced these premarital relationships. We think that uh, we're not worthy, that God cannot accept us anymore. We're broken. We did everything opposite of what he has taught us to do. And um, I hate to say it, but you are listening to the voice of the enemy. Because God has consistently said, come as you are. He doesn't say, stop doing this, stop doing that, stop, you know, before you come to me. When you come to Christ, you are given the strength to turn from sin, to flee from sin. Because the Holy Spirit will indwell you and it will convict you to the core. Trust me, I go through this daily where the Holy Spirit convicts me. And it's not condemning. If you feel condemned, if any type of negative words or thoughts are coming into your head, that's the enemy. Conviction is little, uh, they are like having encouragement to do the right thing. Let's say that uh, you lied, you know, and God 
prompts you to make that right, go back to the person and say, look, I lied. I meant I, I should have said this and maybe I exaggerated the truth and uh, I lied, you know, and just be re repentful for what you have done. So um, I feel like the enemy definitely uses premarital sex, uh, any type of um, thing that strips us from feeling worthy. And I feel that it can, it can definitely strip you to the bone when you think something is there with someone and it's not and they walk away from you after you've given in to the pressures of a sexual relationship and you just feel so broken and you think nobody's going to want me now nobody you know god isn't going to forgive me you are flesh and you will fail you will never be perfect and i hate to break it to you because you're not the only perfect one that walked this earth is jesus christ and you come to him in repentance to approach God for forgiveness. And when a Christian engages in premarital sex or when one has lost their virginity, they must come to Christ and the Holy Spirit will convict them of their sins. And through repentance and turning away and fleeing from sin, one's grief will be over and they will be restored unto Christ. It's important, even vital, to remember this. No sin is beyond the reach of the blood of Jesus. If we confess, he will not only forgive, but will cleanse us from unrighteousness, all unrighteousness. And you can find this in 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. Through forgiveness, which is amazing in itself i mean when you think about the worst thing you could have done and god says i forgive you that grace and that mercy is so amazing and it and it doesn't have to just be premarital sex it can be a lie it can be a you know whatever whatever sin you have committed now the only sin that god will not forgive is that of denial of his son if you cannot acknowledge that jesus christ came to this earth and died for you for your sins then you know, that is the deadliest sin, the most, the, the unforgiving sin. Uh, God restores us and God is faithful and his restorer character is evident in Joel chapter 2, verse 25, when God tells Israel that he will restore the years the locusts have eaten. And of course, it's in a different context, but we can definitely relate to the forgiveness and the restoration that God can provide because that's his character. God loves us. God wants to restore us. God wants us to flee from our sin. God wants us to do what's right and come to him in repentance and then do a 180 and go the other way. Premarital sex is like a locust that consumes our sense of self, self-esteem, self-reflection, and our perception of forgiveness. And do not let the enemy lie to you. He is underneath your feet. God will forgive you. Okay, so don't look at this and say, I'm so unworthy. I don't care how many relationships you have had up until this point. If you come to God right now and ask for repentance and accept Jesus Christ's gift that he gave to us on Calvary, then you will be forgiven and restored and your name will be placed in the book of life. Okay, so don't ever feel unworthy. God can restore everything in us. Second Corinthians chapter 5, 17 tells us that when we come to Christ, we are new creations. So, um, Sorry, it, we don't engage in premarital. So if we engaged in premarital sex to conversion is recreated by God into a new person. So in other words, we're a new creation, even though, like I said, you might have been that person who, you know, slept with someone different every single night and you feel so unworthy and torn apart. All you have to do is come to God. He will 
make you a new creation. The old is gone. The new is here. 180. Flee from sin. Okay? So as Christians, we are being renewed by the Holy Spirit each day we walk with Jesus. Colossians chapter 3 verse 10 tells us that our new self is being renewed day by day to reflect the image of our Creator. There is no sin without hope. Okay, The power of the gospel is available to all who trust in Jesus Christ for forgiveness. So don't let any sin in your life keep you from seeking God through his son Jesus Christ and asking for repentance. God came to die for our sins so that we don't have to live in that unworthiness so that we can be restored. Okay, so make sure that you um, make those changes in your life. When you receive Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit comes in and dwells you, it's an easy road from there. Yes, you will be attacked. There will be trials and tribulations that will come your way. And you'll be like, what? Wait, what? Ha what's happening here? But trust me, God has your back. And if God has your back and God is for you, that's all you need. Okay, so let's end in prayer. Lord, I come before you today. And I ask for forgiveness for the sins that I have committed, whether indirect or indirectly related to the topic at hand. Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you came to this earth to die for my past, present, and future sins. And I accept your sacrifice and free gift of forgiveness that you allotted to me at Calvary. I believe that you died and rose again on the third day and that you are the first fruit of life everlasting. I know that I don't have to be perfect from this day forward, but I will awaken each day in the hope of being more like you than myself. I know you are faithful and on the days I fail you, I am thankful for your loving grace, mercy, and forgiveness. In thy loving, faithful, and powerful name. Amen. Bye, y'all. Have an amazing day.